Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of Vertical Blocks, where today we're joined by Eric Chang from Wave Financial and Sam Harcourt, head of business development here at Phantom. I'm Juan Angel, head of marketing, and I'm really excited for today's conversation. So um, just to kick it off, thanks, uh, Eric, for joining us. Uh, maybe a good place to start would be just tell us a little bit about yourself, your your career trajectory, what's brought you over to where you are right now, and maybe a little bit about the past, including I know you had a great win at ETH Global. So let's start there. Awesome. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. So I- I'm Eric, and I currently work as a uh, venture associate at Wave Financial. So Wave Financial is essentially a SEC registered investment advisor, um, kind of touches a little bit throughout all of crypto, running a number of different types of investment strategies. So I do sit on our venture side where I look at any type of early stage project and spending across you know, various ecosystems. Um, so my foray into crypto has definitely been a little bit unorthodox. Uh, when I was in school, I was studying more to get into more public policy, studying more foreign affairs. Um, I did work with the State Department for just a brief while and realized that, you know, really wasn't for me that lifestyle, Um, you know, a bit too bureaucratic, really kind of fell down the whole crypto rabbit hole once I kind of shifted careers and started doing more like regulatory consulting uh, for a lot of crypto asset managers, uh, essentially helping people kind of understand like, you know, here's not how here's how to not insider trade. Here's not how to not go to jail, you know, per se. Worked with a lot of my clients, realized that I really liked the investment work that they were doing. Uh, so I bet eventually shifted over to the investing side, really, you know, pouring over crypto, learning about blockchain uh, and everything that comes with it. So a little bit on that ETH Global uh, hackathon that I participated in, that was kind of one of the you know, first projects that I really did to really get into uh, crypto. So at the time, I knew you know, almost very, very, very little about uh, blockchain technology, but you know, I was really fortunate to like work with a really nice team that, and, you know, we eventually kind of worked together to put together, uh, you know, really interesting kind of like NFT wallet messaging protocol that eventually, you know, allowed us to kind of win one of the prizes from our sponsors at at that time. So yeah, that really kind of jumpstarted my whole journey into crypto and the rest is history. I love it. I mean, one of the things that we'll certainly be talking about here today is uh, Wave Wave Financial's overall crypto thesis and, and the direction it sees the whole space going. But to start off, since I know that uh, one of your strong interests is NFTs, I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, how do you see NFTs evolving? I, I think we're at a crossroads right now where, um, you know, half the audience is saying it's just monkey pictures and the other half is saying it's going to change the world. So where do you think we are right now? And what do you think some of those opportunities are, are going down the road? Yeah, I definitely feel like we're currently at kind of like a turning point for NFTs. Um, I remember when NFTs st- first started kind of entering mainstream consciousness right before the kind of like the birth of like board apes and, and, and whatnot. And yeah, NFTs were definitely very hype driven uh, and people were definitely focusing a lot on kind of like JPEGs, PFPs and collectibles. And even if you look at the breakdown of, you know, all the NFT sectors right now, right, you'll still see that collectibles and PFPs still kind of make up the lion's share of, uh, of NFT markets as a whole. Uh, but I personally think that, you know, eventually what's interesting is to see the actual birth of like utility driven a- NFTs as well. So I think from a from a VC standpoint, you know, I, I do talk to a lot of founders and various types of protocols that are kind of building more kind of like more like gated access uh, through through the use of NFTs. Right. People that will essentially purchase NFTs so that they can access like certain types of content or, you know, even using NFTs as kind of like. Um, tokens to track like credentials right on, on chain and that can eventually be used for you know, various you know DeFi like you know driven protocols um, so I think it's more like the multifaceted um, applications of NFTs that's fascinating me for for the time going forward and if NFTs really are able to kind of reach a sticking point in terms of that utility I think that's when we'll actually see NFTs really take off aside from just the collectible driven hype that we see right now yeah, that's I think a, it's that's a, go that's ahead, a really interesting point. Sorry, sorry, I cut you off there, one. Um, with NFTs, you know, carrying personal data, do, do you see ticketing um, as much of a use case for NFTs as I'm, I'm starting to see that more and more? But do you see yeah. true utility in that just as a as a sector overall? Yeah, I I think so. I, I, I have to be honest though. I think a lot of times people like to. Um, use blockchain for like certain solutions when really you can just kind of achieve it through like web two solutions right it, it's compelling for me to 
to use blockchain when you really need some kind of like censorship resistance or you really cannot get by with just like a single point of failure through like a centralized solution or if let's say switching to a decentralized solution is actually a lot more cost efficient and, and you'd actually want like a pretty dramatic like cut in cost in order to kind of get over the network effects that you know certain web2 incumbents um, you know would currently have so with, with ticketing I definitely see the utility of, of nfts um, but for me personally I you know I see a lot of like web, web2 kind of solutions that also work at the moment so I'm still trying to really graph like what's the actual sticking point in actually using like nft driven um, t ticketing I, I think it would be interesting um, you know for for example if let's say like you get an NFT ticket, but that also kind of gives you like certain gated access to like other types of content, like, like I mentioned just, just a second ago. So like adding a little bit of that kind of like other type of utility, more entertainment driven, right? So the ticket's not just a ticket, but it's also like a token or a collectible for something more. Uh, that's what I yeah. think would be interesting. Like a, a ticket with an NFT drop almost. Um, exactly. It needs additional web like interaction, yeah. totally. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to go into into kind of better understanding how you evaluate and see opportunities within the different ecosystems. I know that you've been invested in uh, Near, Cardano, Ethereum, and, and now Phantom. Uh, but before we go into that, I think it would be helpful for those who maybe haven't caught the previous episode. Sam, if you could maybe share a little bit or explain what our initiative is here, working with uh, venture capital funds and um, bringing them onto or onboarding them to the Phantom ecosystem so that Eric can pick it up from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just a quick recap. Uh, we're, we're Phantom, the foundation has been interacting with VCs across the board. Uh, we have about eight uh, so and so VC ecosystem partners. Uh, that's the branding that we're going for. Uh, and basically, we work with them directly streamlining deal flow that we receive from Phantom based projects. Uh, and we try to get those uh, deal flows closed with investments from our VC partners. Uh, additionally, we look at other commercial opportunities together. Uh, and just really try to work closer with with uh, the great teams that we actually are working with. So that's a quick recap. Um, otherwise, it's probably best to jump to the previous episode and, and, and get more details there. Yeah, that's the the TLDR from from episode one. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, an example of this collaboration is, is having uh, Eric here today and sharing his insights with us. Um, mm -hmm. So that being said, Eric, I, you know, I'd like to understand, like I said, what some of the opportunities or what you look for when looking for investment opportunities are in different ecosystems. But to understand that, I think it's also helpful to understand what's your, your thesis or your outlook on this sort of multi-chain world we're living in, since, of course, you've invested across several different ecosystems. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's definitely a lot to unpack on, in, in that question. Um, I, I personally think that, yeah, like you said, multi-chain is definitely the, the future. Um, for me, when I'm looking at any type of layer one, um, you know, I try to think about, you know, just what type of kind of specialization or, you know, real strength, like use case, like each layer one has. For example, you know, Ethereum is currently kind of, you know, obviously kind of like the king in the blockchain space where it has, you know, most of the NFT and NFT market. But, you know, where it's lacking is in terms of scalability. But, you know, one might also argue that it's actually, you know, really good in terms of like decentralization and, you know, eventually with the whole roll up environment that's going to be forming on top of Ethereum, then you have, you know, the, the influx of uh, scalability, right? But on the other hand, you have other L1s such as Solana that focus a lot on in terms of scalability. Uh, but some might argue that perhaps like decentralization is not as strong on, on, on these other types of L1s. Um, but I, I, but I personally think that's okay. You know, sometimes like L1s necessitate certain types of trade-offs so that they can serve like different uh, special use cases. So I think it's just looking at in general, like how an L1 or like a foundation that's supporting that L1 is able to really craft out like that specific uh, niche. Um, so yeah, that that's currently like what, what my kind of outlook is in general on like the multi-chain like future. Just um, a quick quick follow up with that. What I've been talking about um, with a few guys is about, you know, each each chain, I think we can see in like 10 years time, it might be each chain has a certain sort of, you know, um, unique character characteristic about it, right? You might have a DeFi chain, you might have a game right. chain, and you have an industrial chain and a government chain and, and all these certain chains. And I believe right, right now, everyone's, you know, 
they want it all and everyone's trying to build everything on their chains and they're going to go for as much market share as we you know I personally have from the Fender Foundation we're going to go for as much market share as we can across all sectors but I do believe um, you know over time that there might be a sort of settle settlement and people will start you know really focusing on what drives that chain um, I don't know if you have any uh, is that something you could also see in the future yeah I, I, I think so um... And, and that's also, if I could, you know, I also wanted to kind of pose a question back, back to you as well. It's just, uh, you know, just like, I feel like right now, like people are saying that Phantom is kind of like mainly like a DeFi driven chain. But as we've seen, like, there's also kind of like a birth of like NFTs on Phantom as well. So would eventually kind of like to, I'm curious to see like what were your what your thoughts are um, on that as well. But yeah, I mean, I think to answer your question, like just in, in general, yeah, like eventually that you you will see like um, L1s try to kind of form a little bit of that specialization, but some L1s are also, you know, better suited for for general use as well. I think it just kind of depends like, you know, over time to see like what what actually is, is the sticking point as each L1 kind of like comes into its own. For Eric's question, um, Sam, did you want to take that? The, I think the question was, and, and uh, you know, it was that Phantom started as a, a DeFi first chainer. That's what it was known for. And now we're seeing a proliferation of, of different types of projects or applications growing on it. Yeah, um, that is, I think it's notable, like, uh, that we've seen a lot of growth in other verticals, you know, whether it's GameFi, NFTs, um, even even working with different institutions across the board on, on building out different products. Um, you know, we are we are no one for our DeFi, but I think over time and hopefully soon enough, we will see uh, more emergence of these other dApps, um, especially in the GameFi sector. I think GameFi is so important because when you're playing a game, you're on the game for, you know, hours at a time, whereas, you know, a DEX, you might just execute a tra few transactions and then move on. Or right. an NFT collection, you might just pick up a few, uh, you know, artists here and there that you really like and maybe you spend some time browsing. But on games, uh, you know, from personal experience, you can be on that for, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. Uh, grinding and and I think that would really increase demand for block space on your chain so that's something that we really should focus on and we are focusing on uh, today and we're seeing a different sorts of games that we see lots of you know eight bit characters coming out and we are starting to see the emergence of some you know triple a triple a quality graphic uh, shooter games coming soon as well um, but yeah definitely it's it's an exciting time for other verticals than just DeFi, but it's not like we want to abandon DeFi either. We want to have a massive focus on DeFi and, and something that we're really focusing on is security within the vertical because um, as we all know, secure any sort of vulnerability that appears on the chain can have um, such detrimental effects overall, not just in that vertical, can even affect the game fast sector of that chain. Um, so with security, you know, partnering up with uh, firms such as DDAB for Watchdog, uh, you know, that's basically a continuous uh, smart contract auditing platform, um, which will, you know, monitor contracts with a TPL of over 10 mil. Um, but again, just uh, in short, TLDR one, uh, yeah, definitely. And we'll see some emergence of cool games and, and uh, NFT artists. I, I would also add to that, you know, that uh, one of the things I find so interesting is that, of course, we're seeing the emergence of uh, some well-established and, and heavy-hitting uh, GameFi teams that come from backgrounds in traditional gaming and are now, are now moving on to the, into the blockchain space, like Encore, which you mentioned, Sam, um, first-person shooters and, and other sorts of games. Uh, but even just going back to the, let's call it the JPEG NFT marketplace sort of uh, scene, uh, VCs are arriving at an interesting point in time because even if you look at uh, something like Lunar Crush, which talks about uh, or shows you um, social media marketing metrics for uh, word of mouth engagement around certain types of hashtags, topics related to crypto. Um, Phantom always is, is pretty high up on the list or historically has been. Uh, and what you need to consider when you look at the kind of engagement transaction activity um, and just general marketplace listings on Phantom is that all of this has been established um, prior and leading to the arrival of, of a real injection of VC capital into the space. So that means that those who are arriving are arriving and investing not in the seed of an idea, but in an existing con uh, concept that has been, uh, you know, elaborated and grown grassroots from the bottoms up by real users engaging and creating and uh, strong bonds and communities with each other um, and, and really pushing, you know, their art and their their concepts and ideas to the next level. Um, so again, I think that's something that's really important to, to, to take into consideration and always remember is that everything that exists on Phantom, yes, now we have this initiative where um, not just way financial, but but other VCs are coming in and investing in the space. But most of everything that you see 
up to today is organic grassroots engagement. These aren't users that have been bought or acquired. These are users that, are vol that have voluntarily come and that are using the platform on a daily basis. So um, the injection of VC capital is just going to further promote that organic growth and help it uh, really kind of uh, expand rather than trying to bootstrap its existence in the first place, which I think is, is an important differentiation to make. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, Going back to, to the, the way financial vision, Eric, and some of the things that you guys look for, when you do come to a space and you look around and you see, okay, what's here and what's its, what, what's the reason for its existence, uh, whether that's on Nier, Cardano, or Phantom, it doesn't matter. You know, what are some of the, the, the criteria or what are some of the indicators that you look at when you're evaluating a team or a product? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so th this is definitely a really interesting one, too. I, I, think, I, I think a lot about... Um, like VC investing is always kind of focusing on, uh, you know, the ability for a certain protocol to build like network effects. You, you have this in traditional Web2 investing and you have this kind of moving into Web3 as well. And I think that network effect is especially salient um, even in Web3 just because of the distributed nature of all the protocols that are built in this space. Uh, like these, these networks only survive with active participation from, from, from users. Um, so, I remember when I first really came into, uh, you know, just kind of meeting the the, the Phantom the Phantom Foundation team. I, I think just just even from that initial call, um, I kind of realized I, I kind of sense like a bit of like enthusiasm and excitement that I don't usually get from like other other like L1 foundations. I remember like I think Sam was on the call and you know some other guys on on, on the team and uh, you guys were you know laughing about about something when I came on the call and I was like, oh, what are you guys laughing about? And you guys were like. Oh, this you know this protocol we were just looking at like it grew so much like overnight like that's that's like awesome to see right it's just like that enthusiasm that you guys have and the active participation that you have from the foundation itself looking at these different ecosystem uh, partners uh, is is something that struck me and as I kind of like went you know deeper down the rabbit hole playing around with like various types of like you know DeFi protocols on Phantom you know pouring through the discords I see that users are actually very you know actively participating you know, very like just actively kind of invested in, you know, like the success of like the protocols that they're using. You know, I found myself also just spending tons of time just like playing around with like different things that are being built in the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, as an investor, you know, I, I spoke with a lot of founders kind of in this space as well. And a lot of the founders also kind of spoke about just kind of the support that they get at the foundation level. You know, I think once they reach a certain PBL, perhaps like they may be eligible for certain grants or, you know, even if two protocols happen to be competitors, uh, you know, they, they actually do come up, come together independently to actually like work on certain initiatives. Um, so these are all certain, you know, like green flags that like I, I saw as I was kind of exploring the e ecosystem. And, you know, these are also just, yeah, just kind of like overall enthusiasm mm -hmm. and kind of like the network effects is what I really look for when I'm evaluating like a new ecosystem. Yeah. One of the things that we've certainly been, been, um, you know, exploring and we've, we're testing different models and the VC ecosystem initiative is, is just one of, of the many things that we're rolling out in terms of um, providing incentives, but it's a really delicate balance, right? The incentives um, sort of scenario where on one hand, if you just give people free money with no strings attached and without requiring them to have any skin in the game, well, that's probably not going to be a very successful user retention strategy in the long term. And on the other hand, if, you know, you don't, don't give anybody anything for you know, to seed anything with, then where's the, how are things going to get kickstarted or, or how are they going to take off? So when you're evaluating the, the different kinds of incentives programs and the ways that different networks are, whether those are layer twos, some layer ones you've invested in, you know, what's, what's that balance in, in, in your opinion is uh, coming from the VC angle of providing enough to provide sustenance, sustenance, but not so much that essentially you're just getting drained of your treasury and liquidity. Um, yeah, w would you mind kind of explaining your question? Do you mean more along the lines of like VCs investing, but not adding much strategic value? Or is it the other way where VCs are kind of offering, uh, you know, kind of capital to these, to these protocols, but protocols don't have a you good, like use of proceeds plan. I think it's just the latter, the latter, you know, where, where the VC capital comes in and then yeah. where, where it goes next is anybody's guess, right? Um, just uh, understanding, uh, how different teams manage um, those kinds of incentives and how they're yeah. uh, disseminated in such a way where it provides value is productive and, and 
leads to long-term network effects rather than it yeah. being a short-term money grab that leaves everybody losing in the end. Right. That, that, that's fair. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, especially in crypto investing, that this is a risk that a lot of investors should, you know, are typically like paying attention to. Right. Um, I think that's also kind of like the difference between like, you know, perhaps like traditional Web2 investing and Web3 investing in that sometimes there's actually like a token, uh, you know, token model kind of built in, right, that you don't typically have with like just equity based models. Right. So then with the influx of tokens, sometimes like founders might be able to kind of start already getting some kind of like income or capital right before that uh, versus like, you know, just traditional kind of equity based companies where, you know, founders only really get their ex like really get, you know, income, like once they start, you know, becoming profitable or they have an exit opportunity or, or, or whatnot. So that is something to kind of, you know, pay attention to in, in kind of crypto investing. Um, you know, typically ways that we kind of try to mitigate that risk is we when we talk to founders, we do try to make sure that they have like, like I said, kind of like a well thought out uh, plan for use of proceeds. Right. So we, we, we do ask sometimes, like, you know, why are you raising? What are you going to be using this capital for? And, uh, you know, sometimes you speak with founders and it really does make sense. It's, you know, sometimes founders might say that they have a very strong sales pipeline or they have a lot of customers waiting to be uh, acquired, but they don't have the infrastructure um, or technology in place to really service all of these certain clients. Right. So in that case, it's very clear, like, OK, we're giving you funding so you can build up the infrastructure and now, now you're going to get more customers coming in. Right. So it's it's kind of like that. Um, I think the the beauty of kind of crypto is also, you know, a lot of a lot of times, you know, things are also recorded on chain. So you can kind of see, you know, if, if it is kind of like all through crypto investing, you can kind of see like, you know, where some of the use of proceeds are going to be. Um, so there's just 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 different kinds of like kind of um, safeguards in place for us to kind of make sure that, you know, protocols are kind of sufficiently using the capital that we that we invest. And of course, we also try to be very involved in the process of their growth as well uh, to check in on them and also help them in any way we can as strategic investors. So just kind of staying, yeah, I think involvement is also just key. Yeah. Let's let's uh, actually dig into that second part then, you know, when, when it comes to, to being strategic advisors, as you just positioned it, you know, what is the value that uh, a VC like Way Financial brings um, to their investment partners? And I know Sam, always talks about how much value you are bringing, but I think it's a good place to, to just hear from you, from your perspective, what are you bringing to the table? Yeah, I, I can speak personally for me where, you know, I definitely care a lot about the well-being of the portfolio companies that that, that we invest in. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I spend a lot of times, you know, just talking to, uh, you know, founders of any of our portfolio companies. Um, I, I try to help them in any way I can. Uh, you know, going into regular meetings with them, helping them craft out their tokenomics, helping them strategy strategize on their business or on marketing, you know, helping to, you know, do some of the leg, some of the legwork in terms of introductions or perhaps like research um, really isn't kind of I, I would say it's not really limited in terms of like the the strategic value that, you know, we we try to bring a, a, as investors and, you know, um, really it, you know, a lot of times the way I think about it is it's it's more a privilege for VCs to be able to invest in and, you know, help out in the growth of a company than the other way around. So really, I just I like to allow like the founders to really dictate like how they want they would like this to help. Um, I think as a firm, you know, Wave definitely has a lot of strengths as well. Um, I, I think we have a pretty strong pipeline in terms of a lot of um, more like TradFi institutions that like to work with Wave. Uh, these institutions typically come to Wave when they want to, you know, get some type of exposure to, to digital assets. And I think at some point that network will, you know, could, could prove itself to be useful uh, once a lot of our portfolios try to go more towards that institutional route. Um, I think in terms of just expertise and kind of experience of the rest of my team in that area as well, um, it, it is also very helpful. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, Wave and you, you might also see this in other investors as well. Uh, they, they might have more like liquid driven uh, DeFi strategy funds as well. So sometimes there could be some type of like collaboration of, let's say, a DeFi protocol uh, that we invest in also requires some kind of like li liquidity provisioning. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of play around with, um, you know, how investors can kind of like add strategic value to a certain portfolio company that they've invested in. <laughs> When, when you're having these conversations with various different uh, teams, are you seeing any themes in terms of, you know, what's low hanging fruit in terms of user acquisition and retention that's, that's not really being um, 
I guess, I guess ex explored to its full potential. And then the second part of that question is, what are some of the, the big uh, hoops or hurdles that, that you see the space having to overcome in the next year? Yeah, I think, I currently think, yeah, perhaps like low hanging fruit. That's, that's, that's a bit hard because I feel like even the low hanging fruit in crypto right now is, is a bit difficult uh, because I definitely think that the next step really is kind of that mainstream adoption, right? Really targeting more, uh, you know, like, you know, retail users, people that are not well versed in the crypto space. I think right now, um, you know, founders always talk about like the total addressable market that they can really tackle like, oh, it's a trillion dollar market, multi-billion dollar market. But, but really, like, what is your actual current, like, serviceable, like, obtainable market, right? It could be a lot smaller, right? It, you're, you're, you're currently just playing around with uh, certain crypto savvy users or people that are kind of crypto curious, kind of playing with, around, around with NFTs, people who, you know, perhaps, like, have, like, a Coinbase wallet and have been buying Ethereum uh, he, here and there, right? So I think, I think that next wave is definitely making crypto seem you know, a bit more secure and easy to use for a lot of users. I think currently right now, right, even myself as like, uh, like more of a more seasoned crypto user, there's still a lot of different wallets and protocols that I personally don't even like have trouble using sometimes, right? Like sometimes like UI, UX for certain protocols are just difficult to use. So I think it's just like having a mindset of like having crypto become like better suited for general use, I think, I think is, you know, kind of like the next step. And even in DeFi as well, you know, uh, you know, looking for ways to, for protocols to become like more regulatorily compliant, right? To seem less scammy, right? We see a lot of um, kind of like regulators really cracking down on a lot of like different types of like uh, companies nowadays too. So it's just about kind of like being able to like be really buttoned up on the regulatory side and being able to be like easily used. That's kind of like the next step in order to like really acquire like customers and really scale. That's um that's a really good point around the the user market, right? Because I've tried explaining to some of my friends how to just you know execute a transaction on MetaMask or you know yeah. just you know uh, sign into something and and they just can't wrap their head around it. They're like, "What do you mean I need a Chrome extension? Like this right. is too hard." And they just you know bang their few computer a few times and walk away, um, yep. and just keep living their lives. But uh, you know, that's such a good point because everyone will say, you know, oh, the total addressable market is, you know, any adult between the ages of 19 to 31, right? Or something like that. Whereas you're right, it probably is much smaller until that UI does uh, get to the next stage where it's as easy as, um, you know, using your phone um, and, and yeah. logging into some apps. So definitely. Uh, I might also ask just a, a more macro question, um, yeah. you know, just kind of rolling on, on, on onto it. Um, you know, I think what's a really interesting thesis was something called the Fat Protocol Thesis. It was released a few mm -hmm. years ago by a guy called Joel um, Monegro. Hopefully I got that name right. Um, mm -hmm. And basically it's the argument that since any layer one or yeah, any, any layer one can always out, outperform the, the, the DAP that's built upon it because they both grow as the DAP grows. So does the layer one at the same time. And therefore the DAP can't, you know, outpace the, the techno technology that it's built on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm 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 a little bit against this theory. I think um, it yeah. is possible, especially with the multi-chain world we have now. We have applications built on you know multiple different layer ones and side chains, and so they can accrue their revenue share through different sorts of uh, streams. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to love to understand your thoughts on it, um, whether you think I'm a bit wrong or, or whether you are a fat protocol thesis bull. Um, I'd love mm -hmm. to your thoughts. No, you're you're definitely right, um, and, and I agree with that sentiment as, as well. Um, yeah, I'm f I'm familiar with the Fat Protocol thesis, um, and I, I do think that uh, and at the time it was written, it was definitely a very interesting uh, framework through which you can kind of think about, yeah, like like crypto investing and where value really kind of like accrues it, uh, in a certain tech stack when you're looking at blockchain. But like you said, Sam, I think that now that's kind of um, evolving, and there's been a couple of papers out that's kind of that kind of serve as like counter arguments to to the, the thesis as well. And I'm kind of a bad VC where I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but <laughs> I've seen them. Um, but I, I think the general gist of uh, of the new counter arguments is that, um, well, like now people are starting to get more more critical as to actually measuring um, how value is accrued on the L1 token. Right. So, for example, we can use we can use Phantom as an example. Right. Let's say like a new protocol is being built on Phantom 
and it's getting a lot of hype, a lot, a lot of TVL, a lot of people are using it, or it's maybe it's an NFT project and a ton of people are buying this NFT and like using it for, I don't know, like, you know, certain types of gated access or content. But does that, does the growth and attention of these, of that protocol, does that actually, um, actually like directly contribute to the value of the Phantom L1 token itself, right? Like is all of that hype like captured and how do you really measure that, right? So that's, that, that's kind of when the FAT protocol thesis kind of really starts to become shaky where you can't really truly, really quantify like how that happens, right? But it's, it, the, the idea is that kind of like, you know, if you're building on the protocol layer, it, it's always going to have a bit more value, but maybe in that instance, right, it's the DAP on top of the, the, the protocol that's actually accruing a lot more value at, at, at the time, right? So, and then things get a little more hairy when, you know, you have like tokens at the DAP level, tokens at the protocol level as well. So, um, and I think yeah. now, like, you know, as, as Juan was talking about earlier, right, with the whole birth of like the multi-chain future, I think now that chains are becoming more interoperable with one another and multi-chain is kind of like more of a salient topic than it was when the FAT protocol thesis was first written. Um, that's kind of also kind of breaking down, uh, you know, kind of like the whole nation state um, kind of concept that you, that you had with blockchain networks before. Um, so that's kind of why, yeah, like nowadays, perhaps FAT protocol thesis is a good starting point, but there's definitely more adaptations to that concept now. Yeah. Although, you know, to jump on the other side and argue for it, um, mm -hmm. you know, something that's, you know, yeah. jumping around here, but um, so something at Phantom uh, that we are focused at is something called vertical scaling, where mm -hmm. you know, we just want to focus on providing the infrastructure. You know, we don't want dApps to have to worry about forking off to their own, you know, side chain or subnet or whatever it is, you know, where they have their own gas token and their own tokenomics around that and have to worry about all these infrastructure issues and, and they get caught on up on that instead and you know the sole focus of what they are whether it's you know a perpetual trading platform whether it's you know a game whatever it is they should be focusing on what makes that great um you know but what we do see uh is when they do stay on the phantom or on the on the network that they grew up on so to speak um they they tend to have you know inline incentives it's like game theory you know they're they're mm -hmm. working with applications and even though they might be slack competitors or or maybe they're, they're not really even um, anything to do with each other, like an NFT project and a, and a DeFi project. Um, then you still see some cross collaboration on that. So you still see, you know, GameFi projects working with NFT collections and NFT collections working with DeFi projects. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that kind of cross collaboration, when they built on the same chain, um, you see like this natural organic like build up, it's like a big snowball and it gets bigger and bigger. And maybe that could be an argument for fat protocol thesis is, when one when one DAP starts to win, it's not just winning for itself; it's winning for, I guess, its community. And then all those DAPs start to spark off, and all that value goes to the L1 um, yeah. through, you know, I guess, gas tokens, and and I guess people see the network and they and they kind of buy into its its vision. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that could be an argument for it. But again, I think it's uh, yeah. it's definitely um it's an interesting interesting uh, theory for sure. Yeah, I, I think it, that definitely is, and uh, I I'd agree too. So. Yeah, it's it's just it's just kind of like an interesting framework through through which to kind of yeah think about uh, you know like value growth in in kind of blockchain networks and sometimes like you said Sam, you know there are examples that kind of uh, you know kind of prove prove that thesis and sometimes mm -hmm. that thesis may be imperfect as well. But I definitely agree like that the more that people kind of use protocols on top of like an L1, like you know typically the more value that accrues to the L1 as well. It's like a it's like an index fund, right? Almost you're buying an index yeah. fund. Of an well, a lot of ways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I I wanted to to bring up, and uh, this is getting a little more philosophical because the word is uh, <laughs> is, is is in the sentence. But I was reading a Forbes article recently where uh, Matteo Dante Perucho of Way Financial said that uh, this was a quote. When we because we're in a you know, he's just saying we're in a bear market, and when we inevitably come back into an appreciating market. It's going to be more sustained and healthier with less speculation and more tried and true investment philosophy. And so one of the things I found interesting is we're seeing this narrative of real yield. I'm sure that you're you're familiar with it, right, of uh, uh, protocols like G um, GMX, for example, right, paying out an Ether rather than their, their native farming token, as, as we've seen previously. But of course, you know, the, the revenue that's being driven by that is the, is the losses of traders. So it is being driven by specul speculation. It's not like this is an application being used in the real world and that's where it's being paid out. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. Like that's perfectly fine. Speculation is a part of the game. But uh, mm -hmm. when, I'm, when, we, when we get back to what does a 
crypto economy that's less tied to speculation and more tied to a true investment philosophy mean? What, what does that mean, right? Like, what are we moving towards? Because clearly real yield and the real yield coming based solely on speculators speculating and the house taking the profits is, is, is not uh, the real yield in the sense that we're thinking about it for the long term. So, you know, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I, I think in that case, utility is definitely key, right? I think before, during, during our most previous, you know, bull market, I think a lot of people were just kind of having a lot of fun, right? Because this bull market was very much coincided with kind of like the birth of kind of like NFTs coming into mainstream consciousness, people like kind of buying board apes and all these other fun NFTs. Um, I think people, yeah, were just having having fun with with what NFT and or like more broadly just blockchain technology can can do. And uh, you know, like you said, Juan, I think you know, speculation to a certain extent is 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 healthy, right? Because you want to be testing out technologies. You want to be, you know, as they say, like moving fast and breaking things and seeing seeing what works. Um, but yeah, but inevitably that does lead to sometimes like, you know, pain, painful, painful bear markets and painful crashes. And sometimes people do, you know, uh, lose a lot of, you know, money in, in during these times. Um, so optimistically, yeah, I, I'd like to agree with, uh, with, you know, Mateo, as you quoted that eventually, you know, once the bull market does come back, that people might be a little bit smarter. Um, I think I personally, you know, pretty guilty of that too. You know, sometimes I, I, I de to a lot of like these random protocols and kind of like got burned in the process, but hopefully next time I'll be smarter. <laughs> and, you know, I tell myself that. Right. Um, but yeah, th but what, as, as kind of like more like a VC standpoint, you know, when I'm looking at, you know, these various protocols, I do try to think like, okay, why exactly do you have a token in the first place? Like, is there actually like a need for your protocol to have a token can your protocol even work without it? If your protocol can work without a token, then and you have a token, then you know that's not a, like an immediate red flag for me. But like that is something that would you know give me pause that I would try to think about you know or seeing whether founders can be thoughtful about kind of minimizing different points of sell pressure uh, for for their tokens. Or sometimes you have um, you know I was helping one of our portfolio companies kind of design their tokenomics too, where it's just like it's kind of almost kind of following that, like that V that V token model where like the longer you hold it, the more benefits you have, but it's, it wasn't just kind of like a financial benefit too. It, it started becoming like, Oh, the longer you hold this token, then, you know, perhaps like that gives you access to like NFTs or this actually gives you like more governance or this, you know, more access to other types of content. Right. So it's just like having more of that multifaceted utility that makes people actually want to hold a token more than just like that speculative, um, incentive is what I think is is key to, uh, you know, kind of like the long term sustainability of any type of protocol. Yeah, we're and, and, uh, just, just and I remember going long on yams back in the day. And uh, that that mm -hmm. wasn't the great. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, it's always fun when, when it's happening. It, it, it was so exciting when, when all those all those, you know, new protocols are being released and all that hype was building around it. I know Juan, are you being DJ uh, recently, or you've been pretty good? I've uh, I, I've rehabilitated slightly over the years, but uh, yeah, I have a <laughs> I have a crypto DJ past as well. Um, nice. Still, still think it's fun. Uh, still love to play the games, but uh, you know, I think I have a an equally split interest with the sustainability of the the, the, the long term growth of the space. Um, yeah. But going back to to Eric's point about you know holding something because of the doors it opens for you. Um, beyond just the idea of if you hold this one, you'll get another one of the same one that's going to be worth more because I think that's step one, but we need to move past step one, step two, um, where I think there's a possibility of it uh, really taking off is when Web3 Gaming manages to onboard the mainstream in such a way where the blockchain just happens to be something that's happening in the background and they are ho holding in-game in -game, uh, NFTs, loot crates, boxes, whatever you want to call it, uh, apparel and skins because of the possibilities that it opens within the game with the added benefit that they can later, for example, sell the playing hours that they've put into leveling up or whatever it is to somebody else without it being a, a total, like, let's say loss of time. Like everybody's had that period of time in their lives where they spent like, wait, for me, it was RuneScape, just spent way too much time playing in RuneScape. <laughs> And I actually ended up selling it to a kid in a parking lot for like $300 six years later. It was, I, I sold, I didn't sell it for enough, but you know, it's like if there had been that opportunity for me to have enjoyed the game and played it all that time and then have later on, if I wanted to exit, sell it to somebody else who wanted to enter at that point where I had left it, 
that would have been a great opportunity. And so uh, for those kinds of people, I think they'll be attracted by the idea of having these in-game NFTs opens the doors to doing more things within the game or, or, or you know, crossing into other game game type universes without necessarily just thinking about the primary driver being this thing's going to go up in value and I'm going to get another thing that goes up in value because of it. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of my, my, uh, I, th I think it's like my thesis of where I think this could start this whole, like the NFT for the NFT's sake, rather than NFT for the, just for the, the main point of it being that it can be sold later and that the having it being sold later, just an added benefit. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know. I mean, I don't know you what would, you guys think about that? Yeah, actually with that, I'm, I'm going to bounce it off to, to, to Eric for like a question. Like, is there a specific vertical that you're focused on at the moment? see you know aggregators or marketplaces or, or i guess you i guess it is utilities right or or is it still yeah. the, the DeFi? is there a specific vertical that you are you know looking at in particular at the moment uh, i think personally for me i i, I kind of look at um really any any sector um i think for nfts i like looking at more you know like consumer kind of facing you know products uh you know things that kind of like make like, like there's a lot of like certain like inefficiencies when it comes to like the nft space right like like even even some just like copyright or like ip management right like certain protocols that kind of like fill in fill in inefficiencies on that end or you know protocols that kind of like make nfts like more dynamic right like using nfts kind of like almost like 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 analytics tool right to like track like uh you know the creden on-chain credentials or even off-chain of uh of, of, of users and you know having that kind of lead to like something more um on the DeFi side i look like looking a lot at like you know more institutional DeFi or like ways that people like different tools that people are using to kind of make DeFi like just more compliant so this comes more from you know my previous consulting days you know having that you know compliance mindset um you know i've worked with regulators before and i i know you know somewhat of the way that they think and you know i'm familiar with some of the regulations so just like seeing like how protocols can be like creative in terms of like meeting these types of like regulatory requirements. Um, I'm also deeply fascinated by, you know, infrastructure as well. And, you know, different types of like, you know, just blockchain tech that just makes the whole space more efficient. So it's really a little bit of, of everything. Yeah. It's, it's definitely interesting seeing the, the play of, of CFI, you know, almost integrating with DeFi to an extent, right? I think there is some like a some way in between there that, that that's probably really going to excel. Um, yep. And then you also have, you know, I guess a big topic around, um, you know, regulation would be the tornado cash sequence, right? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so Aaron, and Juan, this kind of goes to you as well a little bit. Um, you know, do you guys have any thoughts about that? I mean, I think it's, I have to, I have to give, um, you know, props to anyone who can kind of, I guess, uh, you know, stand up to, to, to what happened to the guy who wrote the code. I'm, I've forgotten his name at the moment, but I do think, it, you know, just because you wrote the tools, you shouldn't be, you know, uh, punished for that. It's not like the, the maker of Honda is punished for every time someone has a car crash in, in that car. Um, but but do you guys have any any points around that? Maybe um, uh, yeah, Juan or, or Eric. Well, I uh, I definitely have very strong thoughts about it, but uh, I think it would be more interesting to hear um, Eric's perspective on like what the regulatory space is going to look like moving forward for this, or you know, some potential outcomes. Because for example, looking at Wave Financial, I saw that um, you do have this uh, sort of index uh, portfolio type product offering where you have like. Uh, BTC, ETH, ADA, and it and it mentioned specifically that for tokens that have regulatory lack of clarity, like XMR or Monero, like that's excluded from the list, right? But on the flip side, I also saw that, I, and I, I don't have it pulled up here, but I saw that you invested in some other sort of privacy infrastructure, privacy type protocol, uh, if I'm remember, remembering correctly. So I'm just curious, like, how do you approach this? Because on one hand, you have everything being on chain and that's great in some in some senses for for clarity and uh transparency and you may want that in a lot of situations and in others you probably don't want your entire life on chain for anybody to look into and 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 learn every single personal detail about you and your spending habits and who you are and all these sorts of things so when you're looking at the opportunity or lack thereof in the privacy sector some of the potential outcomes there in terms of the regulatory uh path we're going down what do you see and what are you thinking about yeah, so so I'll start with kind of like the tornado cash example and kind of you know move it broadly to a answer that question. Um, where, where the tornado cash kind of situation is definitely really interesting, right? Because it's like, yeah, like in some ways you can also look you you you're almost just looking at it kind of like as a tool, right? It's it's like a public good that the creators of tornado cash made to make available to you know 
users and whether or not you want to use it for nefarious purposes is really up to the user itself, right? So it, it is it is kind of a gray line in terms of like, you know, like is the is the creator of Tornado Cash actually culpable or, you know, should, should the creator be like facing any type of like regulatory scrutiny? And I think this is kind of like, what you see with a lot of with, with, with regulators, uh, in my personal experience as well, where uh, regulators need regulators need time to really understand uh, how something works at a very thorough level. Um, they need they have a higher threshold for understanding compared to just you know perhaps like investors or like regular users, right? Just because they regulators regulators eventually like they, they can't be wrong, right? Because or they're ultimately the ones in the end to really enforce like you know, regulations that they actually put into it, that, that are put into existence. Um, so it takes time for them to understand. And I, I, they, they typically err on the side of conservatism and kind of like even like overdoing certain types of like enforcement actions uh, in order to be safe before they eventually kind of like loosen up a bit. But so it's unfortunate when you look at these types of situations where regulators are kind of clamping down perhaps a little bit too too draconically than, you know, we, we, we would think. Um, but yeah, and it's to answer your question of, from, from kind of like way financial more specifically, uh, it, it, you know, kind of splitting between like index fund, but us kind of investing in like, you know, uh, privacy protocols on the venture side, that really kind of falls more into kind of just like the difference in fund mandate where, you know, the index fund is more supposed to just kind of invest in perhaps like the larger cap like tokens and, you know, they're perhaps like investors uh, risk tolerance is a bit lower. So to meet fiduciary duty, they would have to, you know, be a little bit more wary of like the tokens that, that they would invest in. Whereas on the venture side, you know, we have a different little bit of a different fund mandate, um, you know, where, where investors understand that some of these investments may be a bit more risky. Um, from, from a VC standpoint, you know, regulatory risk is, is a type of risk that we would take into account when we're looking at investments. Um, how one protocol is able to kind of get over regulatory risk is like a moat in itself, or like a differentiator that it has against other competitors. So perhaps, you know, Tornado Cash, the model d didn't really work because perhaps it's too general use or, you know, it, it could was too easily used for like nefarious purposes. But, you know, I, I find it interesting to perhaps like have the same type of model, but having it compatible with like more, you know, like institutionally compliant protocols, right? Like it'd be interesting to be able to add a privacy layer on top of like, um, what, what is it called? Ave Arc, right? Well, Ave Arc, for example, or like Maple Finance, like these types of like walled garden protocols where you have to undergo some kind of KYC in order to get whitelisted first in order to access the protocol in the first place. But perhaps maybe once you enter it, then you can add like a privacy layer on top so other people can't see like as an institution what transactions you're doing. So I think it's about right finding that middle ground, right? Because it's it's hard it's harder to see regulators clamping down on something like that where it's like you can make the argument, well, these users are are already, you know, KYC'd and and so so they they're like OFAC compliant, right? And typically traditional investors don't have all of their investments under scrutiny. And you can even argue that you know, having everything on chain visible to everyone would actually breach fiduciary duty because then that makes, you know, the investment manager and all the funds that they're holding on behalf of their investors, that makes them susceptible to attack, right? So in that sense, like adding a privacy layer might actually be beneficial. Um, so it's just about kind of, yeah, like looking at how you want to be configuring your privacy layer, um, you know, when it comes into play with like other, other platforms, if that makes sense. That's that's a really interesting angle I hadn't really thought of that everything being on chain can, uh, you know, if there if there are such draconian laws passed where everything has to be fully transparent and on chain with no breaks and everything being linked, then that by default forces forces VCs to break fiduciary duty with the investors that that they're who, whose wealth they're managing. Um, so, wow, that's that's really something I hadn't thought of. That is a really interesting point. Um I don't know, Sam, if you want to go deeper into the, the the privacy point, but one of the things I actually thought would be interesting to, to dive into is I think for the majority of people, uh, when they hear narratives like the institutions are coming, it's very unclear. Like, what does that actually mean for me as a retail investor that's in, in whatever ecosystem trying to make sense of where the future's taking us, right? So, for example, 
you know, you offer a, a wide range of products at Wave Financial. One of the one of these is the wealth management. It's like the index fund, right? Which uh, I think could be, if, if I'm accurately describing it, like a white glove service for institutions to be onboarded without having to have, um, like, you know, direct contact with these different protocols and such. So, could you maybe break down what that product is and what does that actually mean? Like, what's happening behind the scenes when an institution comes to you and says, "We want to invest in crypto." Yeah. So, so these institutions, you know, they 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 vary quite widely in terms of like, you know, what is the nature of these institutions, right? They can be, they they can be kind of yeah, a bit more like traditional financial institutions or asset managers with their own clients that they want to provide, you know, crypto exposure to. It could be family offices, it could be certain like high net worth individuals as well. Um, but yeah, so, but when, whenever these institutions come to us, they come to us as kind of like any other type of, uh, you know, accredited or qualified investor that we, that we take in, you know, they would still have to undergo like the same level of KYC and, and, and kind of other like onboarding processes. And, you know, so as wave, you know, we're, we're an investment advisor. So, you know, we, we would, you know, take, help take their assets, but we do work with, you know, certain types of like, uh, qualified custodians. Um, so, so really it's, we're not really holding the assets per se, you know, they're, those are held with like a custodian and we're essentially kind of working with the custodian. Um, well, not really working with the custodian, but you know, they, they hold custody and then we would just manage the assets and deploy them through various like, um, investment strategies. So that, that's just kind of how, how that works. So like on the index fund, for example, instead of, you know, having like, a like an investor hold like all the, I don't know, top 10 cryptocurrencies by market cap, uh, our custodians holding out on behalf of them and we're managing and rebalancing the, the, the portfolio of, of the index on behalf of the client. That's fascinating. How does um, the, the other, this other project you have called the uh, protocol inventory management uh, tie into that? If, if uh, that's something you could speak on tokenized staking fund for your protocol. I was reading up on it earlier. Yeah, so so we, we also have like kind of like a treasury management division for our for our firm as well. So that's when we actually work directly with, uh, you know, various like protocols or foundations with with a treasury. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, they're these these institutions or organizations are just holding uh, their own native token, or perhaps they're, it's like a mix of like their own native token or stable coins, and it's just kind of sitting there idle. Um, and you know, sometimes if if it's like a really savvy team or if they or if it's, it's a priority for them, they couldn't, they could also have someone uh, hired in house to help them kind of like manage their, their, their treasury for them. Um, but a lot of times, you know, they, that's not something that the, you know, the foundation is really focusing on, right? Like they actually want to be building their protocol instead of worrying about like active asset management for their treasury. So this is the service that way financial kind of endeavors to offer uh, for, for these treasuries. So like you can, you can sign up with us like any other kind of uh, client, and, you know, we, we would, you know, do our best in kind of managing your, your assets for you to try to like earn, earn yield for you or earn some, any type of like alpha. So you can also kind of craft like your risk tolerance. Like, let's say you want active management into other tokens for actual upward, uh, you know, potential, or maybe you just kind of want to keep it as, keep it in stables, maybe like just earn some modest yield here and there. So these are, these are kind of the services that Wave tries to offer. That's There's... Cool. I just um, did I hear somebody's meeting timer go off with like uh, it's like the ten minute timer. Hopefully, we're not running into anyone's meeting time. Oh no, it, it's fine. I'm good until the top of the hour. Oh, cool, cool, cool. cool, cool. I was yeah. I was gonna say, you know, with what you're saying there, Eric, I think there's some strong parallels to to sort of how we view the the value offering we bring to the space. Where you're saying, if you're a protocol founder, you're a technologist, maybe you're not necessarily focused on figuring out how to become an expert. And treasury management and you just want to do what you do best which is build and i think that's that's you know it's it's parallel to to what we're doing here with our vertical scaling narrative at least in a business sense where it's you know if you are a decentralized application and you want to build and you want to scale we're what we want to offer here is um you know a layer one blockchain protocol where you can stay on phantom and scale with us no matter how many users you acquire without having to worry about becoming an expert in running your own whatever roll up layer to yourself and have to figure out all of the kind of technicalities that entail. So I do, I do feel that we're moving in a direction where uh, specificity or specialization is becoming more important, where it can't be 
one kind of team that does it all. It's different teams that are serving different niches. And then whoever is a specialist and does something best just teams up, uh, partners up with whoever does the other thing best. And then that's how you go to the moon, so to speak. Um, so I think there, there are definitely some strong parallels there. Yep, definitely agreed. Yeah, a, a lot of times when I'm speaking with founders too, you know, I, I try to understand, you know, sometimes they try to build their own in own their own in-house solutions, but, you know, I, I talk to them and I'll think, well, there's another team that's building something that you're already kind of building in-house. So like, what's the, what's the purpose of you doing this on your own versus just kind of partnering with someone else? Like, what's the cost breakdown? So yeah, that point definitely resonates with me. Yeah, I think it's interesting that in, in some ways Web3 is is catching up to some of the things that Web2 figured out a long time ago. Like, so for example, I used to be in uh, software sales before I was reborn as a crypto degen. And uh, a conversation that was often had was build versus buy, right? Especially when selling to the enterprise. Um, and with crypto, it, it seems that for some reason, even though there is this, there's never been interoperability and capability like there is in Web3. And yet... We, we still see a lot of the same reiteration of build everything in-house, build it from scratch, when there's probably already team a team out there to whom you could outsource that, uh, that extra overhead and for a fraction of the cost, get a more efficient outcome. So um, I, I see us trending in that direction, but I still see some hesitation where because things are forkable, for example, everybody thinks, well, I'll fork it. What could be the trouble in that? Well, Surprise! Yeah. The, the forking when you fork something, that's not the end of it. You know, there's there's uptake, upkeep, and there's everything else that goes along with it. So, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting to say the least. Yep. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's well, anything else we wanted to cover, Sam. Yeah, I'll just I'll go for a, a much more macro question, and it's it's more to do with uh, equities as well. So, you know, we're seeing when when the equity market takes a hit, so does crypto, and sometimes you know crypto seems to be a leading indicator in that. Um, do you ever think you know crypto will become its own, you know, stand on its own and pull away from the equities in traditional markets, or, or do you think they'll always be correlated in some form or another? Yeah, I I think it's a little bit of both. I think as long as you know, crypto is like a security or kind of like an investable asset, right? Then there, there's, I, I personally think there's, it's inevitable that there's going to be some kind of, like like some of the value of, of, of crypto is going to be tied to uh, just like, you know, macro environments in, in general, right? Just because it, ma macro environment dictates like how much, you know, money that, you know, the average person has to just kind of invest or deploy in like various, you know, kind of like uh, investing opportunities. But, you know, I, and I know I might sound like a broken record now, but yeah, I think like the key is just like true utility of uh, of like of the tokens of these different types of like cryptocurrencies and, and protocols. Right. It's it's once you're actually using a certain protocol um, that, you know, has like real like real world use. Right. That where, where its value is not driven solely by speculation. Right. For a DeFi protocol to. Well, maybe not DeFi, but perhaps like yeah, some kind of some some kind of protocol where, you know, perhaps like decentralized compute or decentralized storage, right? Where where you know the the token the value accrual back to the token is specific own you know majority wise dictated by you know how much you use it in order to be using this decentralized storage or computing service, right? Like once that actually reaches kind of some kind of sticking point, that's when you'll start to see kind of like more of a divergence between macro kind of environments and, you know, the value of like cryptocurrency. So it really just depends on like the underlying utility of, of the protocol. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, that's a great answer. I, my, my kind of, uh, my dream is that the crypto would just become so big that, that equity markets are just on crypto anyway. You know, they just have, they just have their own, you know, I guess, you know, synthetic market there and everything is just crypto in the end. Um, and, and those legacy institutions do slowly start to just integrate or, or die off. But yeah, d definitely agree with your answer. That, that makes a lot of sense. And then we'll uh, I'll be living in Balaji's network state uh, since <laughs> I heard you talking about the nation state earlier, Eric, uh, or, or the, the move past it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, hey, this has been honestly an awesome conversation. I learned a lot. I hope uh, our, our listeners are going to take away a lot from it as well. Um, we'll definitely, uh, would like to hear, you know, where people can follow you to learn more about what you're working on and what way financial is working on. Uh, and of course, any parting thoughts you might have, you might want to leave the listeners with. Yeah, definitely. No, thanks very much for, for having me. And, uh, I think, yeah, good ways to follow 
us, I think we just follow us on, you know, wavegp.com. I think uh, you'd be able to kind of access a lot of our social media uh, through there. Um, probably would be able to kind of find me, um, you know, through, through some means as well. Um, I do have a Twitter, but I forgot the, my, the name of my handle. So maybe I can share that with you guys and then you guys can, I don't know, post yeah. that on your website or something like that. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of different ways that you can kind of find Wave Financial online. Uh, yeah. yeah, really happy to be here and yeah, just kind of looking forward to, I don't know, all the optimistic visions and dreams that we have about crypto, like coming, coming true. I think it's, it's nice when you're able to kind of just talk with everyone who like, has like a you know very similar viewpoints and they just kind of want to see like the well-being and success of this space right so i think that's kind of like one of the main indicators of like you know a, a space that has a lot of growth potential definitely and uh if, if a project is looking um you know to, to get in touch with you feel free to ping me and and you know we do have that that deal flow uh you know kind of that we'll pass on to and, and we'll hit eric's desk so um, you know, be rest assured <laughs> if he's not responding to your Twitter. Um, so yeah, that was, that was awesome. Thanks guys as well. Juan, it was, it was awesome to be here with you and, and kind of do a bit of co-hosting today. It was, it was quite fun. And Eric, thanks so much. It was um, really interesting some of your answers and especially that point around 28 cash. That was, uh, that was really, that was really interesting road to, to kind of explore. So um, it's awesome to be here with you guys. Yeah, awesome, yeah. Likewise, make sure to follow us at phantom FDN on Twitter. So you got mine memorized, Eric. Uh, and uh, I've got got my little Twitter handle here, my name as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and you can if you want to ping Sam, you can ping him at info at phantom dot foundation. That's the best way to get in touch. And if you have any questions about uh, investing, uh, investing or, or getting in touch with Way Financial, that's the best way to do it. So um, thanks again, Eric. Thanks, Sam. And uh, till the next one. See y'all. Thanks. For